Yeah, welcome back to Community Matters. I'm Jay Fidel here on Think Tech, and uh, we're talking with a peacemaker today. Are you ready? A peacemaker, Peter Adler. I'm going to talk about civil war. We're talking about a novel that he's writing or has written, which is now circulating for publication, um, which reflects thoughts that he has had and which I agree with him about uh, concerning, you know, the ongoing civil risks, disturbances and possibilities of civil war. Have we ever finished fighting the civil war? Um, Peter, welcome to the show. This is going to be kind of an important show. Um, thank you for coming down. Thanks, Jay. I, I, you know, I so admire what you are doing. The citizen journalism effort, it, yeah, and that's partly why I'm on your board, because I just believe strongly in this and what you're doing. Congratulations to you and Carol on standing it all up and moving it along. Thank you. We enjoy it. It, it becomes a, a dedication for us. <clears throat> so peacemaker, well, t tell us about being a peacemaker and how you look at the world through the eyes of a peacemaker. You know, uh, for the last 30 years, I've been in working in one way or another as a mediator, as a facilitator, as a planner and a strategist on when there's a lot of disruption. And it's been the work that I've done. I was head of the Neighborhood Justice Center, which has now evolved into the Mediation Center of the Pacific. I worked for the Supreme Court for a number of years. I headed up a big science and public policy program in Colorado for a number of years. I was sort of wooed away for a little while. And then I realized the surf wasn't that great in Colorado. So, uh, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. And I, I also have a number of senior folks like myself who've done this for a long time and we have a lot of conversations and we compare notes about our cases and without revealing confidences and strategies and tactics we're always on the hunt and i'll just tell you when i work on something and it achieves a good resolution i feel like a million bucks i still feel that way i don't make a million bucks but i feel that way and so i, I love what i do it's in my dna and uh, it's the only thing i know how to do and your book um you know, reflects your experience in peacekeeping in the Peace Corps, your experience in peacekeeping in your arbitration mediation company, Accord 3.0, and, and your career in general. Um, but now you have this book, and the book uh, that it's called Defiance at, at Duck Springs, yep. the story of small town America and the next civil war. Um, th th that is a long way from peacekeeping, but it sounds like you have you have created at least, you know, for the book, um, a, a world um, perhaps that goes further um, and explores reality as it as it is coming upon us. The sea change of our world here uh, in COVID, the sea change of our world under Trump. Um, it's a new world you're looking at in this book. Uh, can you talk about the relationship of your peacekeeping experience and the world you've built in the book? Well, it's probably an odd thing that I wrote this, but, you know, I am an inveterate scribbler and writer, and I write mainly for my own self, and I've written four books, and you've seen one, the India 40 and the Circle of Demons book, which was the Peace Corps story. But this, I wanted to write, a, I tried my hand at writing a novel, and it takes place in 2037. So it's out in the future, but it's not that far out. And it's about a guy named Danny Goodman, who's a disbarred lawyer and an ex-Marine and a kind of a secular Jew and a rather foul-mouthed philosopher who's had some hard times. And he kind of runs off uh, to a cabin deep in the woods of Washington State. And it's actually a place where I, I sort of lived for a short period of time out in the woods. And he is slowly drawn into, he really wants to escape everything. He's running from some miseries and he, he really wants to stay secluded, secluded, but he actually falls in love with a local woman who in this little town. And while they're doing that, a new civil war is breaking out in the United States. And it's a pretty fulsome war. It's a real fight. There's been a coup d'etat. A lot of the, the Washington, D.C. and some of the state capital governments have been decapitated. And so it's about this uh, violent coup d'etat and about this small town, which uh, puts up a resistance. And, uh, you know, after the president is assassinated. So it's got a, it's a novel. And I wrote it uh, partly out of my own 
fears for what lies ahead and as a precautionary tale. But I also wanted to write a good story. I wanted to write a yarn. I like writing. I like reading stories and I like writing stories. And I like going to movies and when I have the time to do all that. So I worked on this for a couple of years and it is now sitting with a literary agent through a friend of mine and moving around to some publishers, uh, presumably in New York and elsewhere. And we'll see if it comes out. And if it does, you know, if it does, I'm, I'll be very happy. It's not about making a lot of money. It's much more about, uh, you know, kind of sending a warning flare up, a warning signal, not that there aren't enough of them in, in and around. <laughs> That's the story, Jay. So did you, um, did you fold in the insurrection somehow? Uh, yes. I mean, it takes place through an insurrection, a right wing insurrection. Uh, and there are characters in there that would vaguely resemble certain, you know, guys like Trump or Flynn or others who are, are really bent on uh, separation and takeover. They think the country has gone bad. They think it's uh, really gone deeply bad. And they really stage a revolution. And they want to, the cities are on fire. I mean, they've built an army. They've united militias and uh, protest groups right-wing protest groups, the, you know, and they've pulled them together. They've created something that looks a little bit like QAnon, it's called, that I call Pharaoh, and uh, they've managed to pull it off. But at the end, uh, there's a lot of resistance, and this small town is one part of that. It's a happy ending? Yes. <laughs> but I don't want to... We need a happy ending, you know? <laughs> know it's, good. it's got a good ending in it, too, but it's... It's got a lot of, uh, you know, uh, grim stuff that happens to people in between. Well, I, I guess you explore the whole social compact and uh, the social chemistry, if you will, that, that has created a, our, our bifurcation in this country, our divisive, you know, world that we live in. Um, and so, I mean, to me, that's a fascinating part of the story because I think we're living in that. You are writing about what we are living. Well, you're absolutely correct because I think you can, we will be able to look back on our time and we'll see the seeds of things that we either, uh, that really pulled us apart and destroyed us or that we overcame politically, socially, culturally, economically. And my hope, uh, I'm an optimist. I always stay optimistic. And, you know, you can't do the kind of work that I and my colleagues do if you're not optimistic, but you scratch an optimist and you'll find skeptics and a little bit of cynicism, too, and worries. So this book was kind of the result of all that. You know, I, I want to I did a poll recently to a lot of my colleagues. I sent a poll out to about 50 people and I said, what do you think the prospects are for a civil war? And I got a lot of really interesting numbers. I said seven high, one low. What's give me your number on the on if you're making a prediction? And most people said it's probably around four. It could be a serious outbreak. And then others said, you know what, gee, it all depends on how you define civil war. But I've been watching politically and socially and culturally what is going on in the country. I'm like you. I'm a, an inveterate observer. And there's a lot of white noise, but there's also a lot of signals that come through in the noise. And one of the ones, I just want to read you one that, that came my way, uh, that I went, my goodness, that's us. And this is from a Sri Lankan guy, Indi Samarjiva, who, who dealt with a prolonged civil war in Sri Lanka, the Tamil Tigers and all that. And he wrote this. He said, I lived through the end of a civil war. I moved back to Sri Lanka in my 20s, just as the ceasefire fell apart. Do you know what it was like for me? Quite normal. I went to work. I went out. I dated. This is what Americans don't understand. They're waiting to get personally punched in the nose while ash falls from the sky. But that's not how this happens. As someone who's already experienced societal breakdown, here's the truth. America has already collapsed. What you're feeling is exactly how it feels. It's Saturday. And you're thinking about food while the world is on fire. This is normal. This is life during collapse. If you're waiting for a moment where you're like, well, this is it. I'm telling you, it never comes. Nobody comes on TV and says things are officially bad. Collapse is just a series of ordinary days in between extraordinary bullshit. Most of it happening to someone else. And that's all it is. I was struck by this guy who said, you know, we, we kind of adapt. It's sort of like the frog in the, you know, water that's being heated you don't jump out i mean it just dies eventually and we're kind of like that we're sort of immunized and it's very hard 
given all the white noise in the social media and in the in the television set on Fox News, on CNN, on MSNBC, it's very hard to put the signals together and read the signals in the noise. Yes, absolutely, yes. It's um, like the frog in the water. And uh, the job of the ardent observer is to connect the dots, to remember. Right. You know, I'm the, what you describe uh, is, a, is, a, is a scenario where you forget. You forget what happened and how this week is different from last week. And as, as you say, punctuated by events that are, you know, that are surprising and unpleasant, but um, your day goes on, your week goes on. It's just somehow different and it's on a decline. Yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> for example, it takes longer to get to see a doctor. There's not so much bread on the shelves in Safeway. Um, you know, maybe uh, some of your favorite restaurants are gone. Uh, maybe the retail stores aren't around. And you're not dealing with as many people as you used to deal with. Um, and the newspaper is reporting things that are, that are unpleasant, but it still reports and <clears throat> so forth. Uh, so one of the things you've said, Peter, and I would like to explore is uh, the world is on fire. And if you do connect the dots, you could easily come to that conclusion right now today. And I suspect that your book, your book covers that. Your book is, is a look into the future um, as you might see it. So why do you think that the world is on fire? What are the indicia that you would point to, to for the proposition that the world is on fire? Well, you, you know, all you have to do is, I mean, just watch yesterday's news about what's going on with Russia and Ukraine, and we see the external versions. You know, there's a, a part of a group that has been talking a lot and exploring a topic called gray zone conflict and hybrid warfare. And, you know, uh, uh, it, it's, it's an a interesting situation because the definition of gray zone conflict is one in which there are, there's yeah, you have neither war nor peace. You're in between. You're in a kind of a limbo land. And that's kind of what I think is going on today, both internally in the United States, as well as an internationally. I think we're in a odd state of gray zone conflict where we're not fully at war, although we might be with Russia now. Who knows what's coming there? But um, and we're not really at peace. We're, we're in this new world. And, you know, uh, one of our other colleagues uh, Fig Newton, he can talk about this. He knows what's going on. He's a former three-star, uh, you know, Air Force guy, and and he thinks a lot about hybrid warfare and the challenges. And that's why he calls his part, uh, you know, kind of point zero. What do we do before it all breaks out? And but we're in this odd state. We're in a very hot zone state right now, and uh, you don't know what you know. It's sort of like we know what temperature water boils at, but we never know what molecule boils first. We don't know where it's going to erupt. So the novel was a piece of fiction, kind of speculative and certainly a precautionary tale. But you know, I'll just say one more thing, Jay. My in my day to day work, I talk with colleagues who are like me, mediating very complex cases all around the country. And we, I, it's been amazing to me how much this world of gray zone conflict is preoccupies us. And so that's part of the reason why I wrote this blog piece, which I think I sent to you. And basically I said, what do we do? You know, what do we do about this? And at the end of the day, we guy, we, these, you know, would be peacemakers and mediators have to go out and just do our job. We have to do our work. We have to go do our job because I don't have traction on, What's going on in uh, D.C.? I don't know why. You know, Don't Look Up. It's a movie yeah, with... Uh, yeah. Have you seen that movie? <laughs> I haven't seen it, but I know of it, and I've heard about it. I heard it's great. It's extraordinary because it, it tracks on exactly what you're saying. There's, um, what you, don't, you don't really have power to change things. You know, a lot of people say, oh, run for office. Well, that's, that's not going to really change things. You can run for office and you can articulate positions. You can come on think tech, okay, every day. And you can warn people about, you can write books every day and warn people, but that, that may not change a thing. And, and, and that's the, the premise of this movie. And if you watch it carefully, you, you will see 
you know, it's 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 funny, but it's not funny. <laughs> in all of humor, there is tragedy. These people are sitting around a table at the end, and they're astronomers, and they know that there's a meteor meteorite or something, you know, of the size of Manhattan coming to really destroy the environment in Earth. And um, they know that they have six or seven minutes to live. And they're talking about what brand of coffee do you like to shop for in the local grocery? <laughs> why? What else are you going to talk about? <laughs> that's why. <laughs> well, I, yeah, that's kind of where we're at, isn't it? Right. And, you know, I always wonder, Jay, because we think of, because we live here in Hawaii, what, what does that mean for us? Because we are far away from other places, we're distant from a lot of these uh, kind of bigger politics that go on. We have our own set of problems and miseries that we wring our hands about and we're worried about, and rightfully so. But, you know, we, we have a little bit of distance on that, but that could collapse in a minute. It could collapse in a minute. Well, that's what I, you know, you used the word a little while ago, erupt. And the guy from Bangladesh, was it that you quoted? And it's very interesting. You know, you, you live your life, you go every day, and it's pretty much the same, but it's a, a gradual frog in the frog in the water kind of experience. And and at some point along the way, you say, hmm, this isn't really working at all. I think I'm I think I'm boiling. Uh hot in here. <laughs> <get really? laughs> but the word erupt is is really worth focusing on for just a moment because things are changing. Um, and and the changes are not necessarily good, and and they bespeak of the possibility of an eruption of a, a cataclysmic event that changes everything for us. Um, you know, another insurrection, an insurrection that works, an insurrection destroys uh, the the federal government, well, the government in general. Um, trouble in Europe that crosses the western boundary of Ukraine, which is an entirely possible now. Um, so I guess that's how do you how do you build that in? Because that eruption could be a very bad time. And I was going to say, let me throw it in before I finish my question. Your book and the notion of and fighting a civil war and the notion of you know, having social disruption as the kind that you and I have never seen or even imagined in our lifetimes, it, this kind of violence kills people. People will die. Just like in COVID. And the problem with dying, I'm going to articulate this now. The problem with dying is you can't speak anymore. You can't write books. You, you can't run for office. Um, you, can't, you cannot come on a think tech show and talk about this because you're dead. Um, the, and the history is spoken. History is written by the survivors, not the, and so in all of this possibility of a civil war and disruption, people die. How do you factor that in? Well, what, you know, Jay, one of the realities is you and I and a lot of our good friends and colleagues, although some have passed away, but most of us are still on this side of the grass. And so while we have a breath and while we can do things and while we can think about things and while we can act within our orbits of action, wherever we can do, we have that capability. But the world is really, I think, is melting. It's melting away, and it is a hot zone now. It's really a gray zone with a lot of different kinds of conflicts. And I don't know the points at which they did. The book I wrote, the speculative novel, it's a novel and it's a fiction, but it's speculative. And it takes place in 2037, and after a lot of you know, historical traumas that run up between now and then, none of which would be surprising. But uh, all of a sudden, it does erupt. All of a sudden, there is a decapitation. All of a sudden, uh, right-wing militias are connected. And all of a sudden, there are characters around who would love to uh, decapitate the government and take over. It's, a real, it's, it's one of those distant realities. And my fingers are crossed that it doesn't come true. And it's sort of like, you know, you're all confronting your worst fears, Jay. We, we, you know, there's something about confronting those worst fears, which is kind of what I did in this novel. And then it's back to work. I got to go work every day and just do what I do. But uh, it, it was a real interesting experience writing this. I do hope it gets published and uh, eventually it'll come out someplace. I know that. You know. No, I suspect it'd be, a, it'd be a great cable movie too. Maybe a series, you know. Um, uh, it's more exciting than some of the things that I, I'm seeing on cable now, frankly. Um, so what does your world look like after the decapitation? What is, what is life like in that next, um, that next model? 
Um, because, I, you know, to me, I know there will be changes. I know some of them will be very unpleasant. I know there's a real possibility that I and my friends will not survive. But assuming I do, I won't have I won't have democracy around. I won't have a lot of the trappings of civilized communal life of a social fabric that is mutually supportive of a caring community. I know those things are at great risk. What is your world like as you portray it in the book? Well, remember, it's a fiction. So and it takes place over in 2037 and 2038. And by 2039, there's a, the civil war is over. It's been fought off. It's been a resistance that's popped up in many different places. And, and everybody, what, what's really going on is rebuilding. All of a sudden, we have to rebuild. We have to rebuild Congress, the presidency, small towns, small communities. Everybody has to rebuild because there's been a lot of carnage. And that's my guess is what would happen. We go through these episodes and, you know, it will rebuild. Just like, you know, our people rebuilt after World War II and you can't say they did everything nice, but that's what life is like. It's a series of very, very hard moments and then a, a carrying on. I, you know, I have a, a colleague of mine who's a very, very fine mediator. He's a attorney and a guy. And he once in a while, no, oh, maybe three times a year, we go down to the beach and get some coffee and sit and talk about the meaning of life. And my conclusion always has been the meaning of life is possibility. It's all about possibility. It's all about the, the remain. When you run out of possibility, you run out of life is what you do. So for me, there's always I'm optimistic. I'm sunny side up. I'm, I kind of uh, look over my shoulder. I'm pretty careful. As Woody Allen once said, you know, the cup of life is more than half full, but it may have a little arsenic in it. And <laughs> so, so we, you know, we, we're mindful. We're trying to stay mindful, of, but we're trying to also, you know, stay optimistic that even through all the ups and downs and the horrors of the last century and the prospective horrors of this century, that possibility exists and we will re redo things. Remember, it's a fiction. It's a piece of fiction. It's not meant to be a perfect prediction of what's going to go on. Who well, Nobody could do that. I mean, no, you can only speculate. Absolutely. I accept it's that. It's yeah. a novel. I hope it's a good read for when it gets published and people enjoy the story, too. Because so, so we have some overwhelming things, you know, that are going on in our lives. Aside, aside from, you know, the political Michigas, uh, both here and in Europe, um, and elsewhere. And don't forget Latin America. Don't forget China. Um, anyway, uh, the question I, I, I'm interested in is where where do you put these um, non-political social events like, for example, COVID, like, for example, climate change, which is inexorable. You know, I wonder if Vladimir Putin has thought about wasting his time with an adventure in Ukraine when climate change is happening all around us and wildfires are burning and will burn all over the world. What is he wasting his time about? Anyway, my, my point though is where do you put them into this, into the fiction, the speculative fiction that you're writing about? Well, there's a lot of things that, uh, you know, and one of the writers calls black swans, unpredictable events, things that we nobody could see. They just came along and they have big reverberations. COVID is a little bit like that for us. Climate change is one that we have foreseen, but the consequences of it have really come to the point where we take action, serious actions. You know, when Sputnik went up and it scared the hell out of all the Americans, that was a black swan. Nobody expected that. Nobody expected the breakup of the Soviet Union and nobody would have predicted Putin would try to put it all back together. These are kind of black swan events. Black swans are very rare. A lot of white swans, but every once in a while we get a black swan. And uh, so, so we can't predict the future with any certitude. All we can do is try and manage the, the, the messes that we have at the moment with the hope that it will come together and prevent some other one. But I, I have no delusions about this. I think life is imperfect. The future is imperfect. We're, we, we won't be able to predict everything that goes on. And all you can do, Jay, is do what you do so well at Think Tech, which is bring about the right conversations and alert people. And all I can do is my work as a uh, help people have these difficult discussions on snarky problems, try to solve them. That's all we can do. Well, that, that takes me to another question, though. 
Um, so you're the peacemaker and you deal with human relationships because at the end of the day, we are mammals. Uh, we have biochemistry that drives us, I'm afraid. It's not necessarily an intellectual process, it's biochemistry. And uh, we come before you and we express our hostilities, our hatred, our bigotry, our you know, our, all the failures of the human spirit. And you try to put us back together again, okay? And you have observed this your whole professional life. Okay, and right now, and it was especially visible, um, it emerged in the, in the time of Trump, um, let his name be erased. Um, and, um, and you saw the social fabric tearing, being fragmented, the people dividing on every bloody issue, every single thought was being, has been, is being arguably politicized. <laughs> so here you are trying to put Humpty back together again in your arbitration mediation practice, your peacemaker practice. And I'm asking you about the dynamic of our country and our community here in Hawaii. It seems to me that we are on a trend uh, while we're boiling in the water. Uh, we're on a trend where the social fabric is being torn. People don't get along the same way they did. They're not tolerant. They're not willing to accept, you know, the predicament of the other guy. They're not willing to negotiate. They, they find uh, political divisiveness in everything. Um, do you see that in your mediation, your peacemaking? I do see that. And my limitation is I can only work with groups or people at the moment that they are ready to negotiate. And if everybody is absolutely convinced that their strategy is perfect and they're happy with the way a conflict is unfolding, I'm not that helpful. I can't be that helpful. So a lot of the heart blood of what I do is involved in negotiation, communication, convene, right kind of convening at the right time in the right way with the right people. And if people aren't ready to do it, I can't help them. I can't force them to do things they don't want to do. But people begin to assess risks. You know, we use the word risk, you use that. And people begin to assess the risk and say, you know, how is this going to come out? What's the, my upside and downside? Just like lawyers do that in thinking about their cases. What's this going to turn out to be? What's, what's the best and the worst that can happen? And they, you know, do that. And every once in a while, people, you know, go bonkers and they make a misreading on it and they get bonked. I, sometimes in some of the mediations I've done, walking into a conference room lined with law books, I'll remind people that as 50% uh, of the people lost. 50% <laughs> of those people in those law books lost. So let's talk <laughs> Turkey today and let's do it with civility. That's very worthy. <laughs> You know, the other thing is, uh, you know, with COVID, you know, the last couple going on three years and, you know, they say the numbers are down and I'm happy about that. But at the same time, deaths are not all that much down. And, and um, you know, who knows where the next uh, variant is coming from. And it's a long term thing, just like the Black Plague was in, in the 14th century. You know, there was a 10 year period where everybody was you know, dying. Half of Europe died. Um, but then it kept coming back. Um, and it, in fact, until they figured out what it was with bacteria and fleas and all that, um, it, it kept popping up all over Europe for a long time. Um, so anyway, the COVID has been instructive, you'll agree. COVID has changed our lives, not only here, but everywhere in the world. When Joe Biden gets on the phone to talk about, um, you know, trying to settle things in Ukraine, he's talking to Europe on Zoom or Skype or one of those. Um, and so the whole world is kind of closer together somehow, but somehow further apart because you can manipulate your image. You can you know, do things that are not the same, do not, do not have the same genuine quality, authenticity that a personal contact in the same room would give you. And so, Mm, Zoom has changed us, virtual connections have changed us. And I wonder your thoughts about that. Because on the one hand, you say, why, well, I can talk to somebody in Bangladesh today, no problem. And it isn't, it's no problem. And I wouldn't have the chance to do that. So I'm connecting all around the world. But at the same time, it's not personal. And so if you're trying to make peace, for example, in a given matter of mediation, um, can you get the same result? Can you get the same emotional investment? Can you get the same emotional 
transparency uh, that that you would have in person. How how is this working for you? How is it working for us? How is it working for our future? Well, a lot of the work that I've been doing on these mediations and bringing people together for difficult discussions and trying to solve problems for the last couple of years, it has been on Zoom. And uh, I'm glad that Zoom is there and we still are able to utilize it to try our best. I recently had a labor management matter that came my way, oddly. That's not the area that I do most of my work in, but I was approached and we actually had some face-to-face meetings in a meeting room, in a conference room downtown. And it was stunning to me what what a change it was to be in the room. And people had to kind of cough some bones out of their throat, both on both sides. And they did that. We did that. And then we could settle down and start to work on, well, how are we going to craft the future for you guys, your labor union and your your company counterparts? And it, it made so much difference being in the same room, having breaking bread together, bringing donuts and, you know, malasadas and drinking coffee. And we were all masked up and sitting separately and all that but it was kinetic. There was something kinetic about that that was so refreshing. And I kind of think it really helped at this moment where people were at a bit of a standstill and impasse. So, uh, you know, we're gonna keep doing a lot more on Zoom, but we will also for certain things, try to get people in the room together, COVID permitting, COVID permitting. I think the world has changed. I think the way we deal with each other is different. But there's something about getting together and sitting around that kitchen table or that conference table and really trying to talk to each other as humans and not as electrons. There's something about that that I don't think we will get away from. I just uh, I think we're going to always be wanting that. And a part of a lot of us is hungry for it. We're hungry for those kind of interpersonal reactions. I like coming up and visiting with you and having a coffee. I like that much better than I like talking on Zoom. Not that this is bad. So I think, but Zoom enables us to talk. Well, Zoom right. enables me me to have a very, you know, you can say this is a public conversation, but it's also very personal, very private. It's you and me. It's what it is. That's because you're skilled at this. You're so skilled at getting people <laughs> like me to yakety yak and talk story. So, so, but you're right. I mean, it's not going to help with uh, trying to connect with the Sri Lankan or the Bangladeshi. Those are going to require long distance communication. So we're in an interesting new hybrid world on this stuff. And I think we'll keep learning about how to use it to maximum uh, ability and maximum efficiency and a maximum utility. Let's assume that for a minute. Let's assume that we we find that Zoom has changed our lives. So we like Zoom. You don't have to drive or park. You don't have to fly anywhere. You just sit down in your you know any part of your house and talk to anybody in the world. And this is you know, and for think tech, this has been a tremendously lucky break because we were ready for it. We already were using Zoom. Um, but but here's this though: um, you talk in your book and you talk in this show um, about um, about people in the next civil war about the stresses and strains of a of a social fabric which is torn or at least tearing and i give you now a country of 330 million or a world of 7 billion where x percent of the human communications are conducted or will be conducted electronically not in person does that bring us closer to the disruption you're worried about, to the civil war you're worried about, or further away? Yeah, I worry about some of that because we have this explosion of social media that is sort of out of control and can be used by anybody for anything, promulgating anything. And that's part of what's creating this white noise uh, out there, which makes it so hard to reach out and create the right discussions and read the right sim- signals into the white noise. And that's, that's part of the, the challenge here is what are the signals telling us as we see Twitter and Instagram and, you know, all all the different social media channels, which can be used for good or bad purposes. We know that, we know that. So, but there is something about, uh, I'm finding at the right time and in the right moment, in the right way, getting people together to look each other in the eye and begin to fashion solutions. There's something now it's rare. It's not going to be the prevalent thing, but that's what media, that's what we do. We get people together, have these hard discussions and try and find solutions, partial solutions, fulsome solutions. Yeah. And we're going to keep doing that. There's always going to be people who want to try to find 
a way forward. I stay optimistic about that. I'm very optimistic. We're not going to go away. Last question. Um, as a as a professional in mediation, arbitration, resolving disputes, finding, may I use the word truth, you have to be very, very concerned about truth. And there's a lot of untruth out there. We have seen it up close. I can turn my television on. You know, I have a thing about Fox News. I will watch Fox News until the first lie. And then I turn off Fox News. Oh, I have never been able to get past about 10 seconds. <laughs> There's just me. So, so the, the, question is, the question is this. Um, we talk about critical thinking. Everybody talks about critical thinking. Critical, I mean, they, they use it loosely in critical race theory. But critical thinking is, is, is what you're talking about. And maybe critical thinking is the difference between uh, being in an electronic environment and being in a personal environment where you can see this, the roar of the grease paint and the smell of the crowd and all that. Um, so what is critical thinking? I'm asking you to leave a message from your experience, your, your speculative novel, um, and your life experience in general. Um, you know, what is critical thinking? Talk to the kids out there for a moment, Peter. Tell them what it really is. Uh, well, you're asking me a hard question at the end of this conversation. My goodness. Um, I actually do. I like critical thinking, which means examining assumptions and applying some systematic rigor, asking people for what is the evidence that we can put on the table and weigh on particular things. So I like that. I like using that. But, you know, the, the, I think the world is not made of truth or data. It's made of stories. And part of what my, I and my colleagues do, we do something that has an old Latin name, and so it goes back into Blackstone's law, and it's called tertium quid, and it's about trying to hear one story, hear the other story, and then get everybody to fashion the new story going forward. I believe the world is made of our stories. The law is a story. Philosophy is a story. Science is a story, and critical thinking can apply in all of those. But at the end of the day, it's really getting people to say, what's our, what's our next chapter? And can we begin to agree on that? Can we get some foresight and some imagination and some strategy? So critical thinking, wonderful stuff. And it's a means to other ends. It's not an end by itself. I knew I'd get a fabulous answer on that question. <laughs> <laughs> you ask hard questions. I tell you, that's what I love. Peter Adler, a mediator, a, a, a truth teller, a, a peacemaker, uh, and a member of our board. Thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, it's been wonderful to talk to you. I look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks, Jay. Aloha. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.